Let's look at um, vertical circular motion and some of the mathematics that goes with that. Vertical circular motion. <laughs> Um, okay, so just recall that we have this formula here, Fc equals mv squared over r, and this just tells you how much force is necessary to keep an object of mass m and velocity v going around radius r, okay? And so we've dealt with scenarios where this is happening kind of on its side, okay? But now we're going to turn this, I guess vertically okay so now we've got down and we've got up okay so we're looking at this from its side so if you were like the person doing this you might be standing there and you might have your hand here whipping this thing in a circle okay like it's a yo-yo or something okay so you're doing it vertically and you're really enjoying yourself because it's fun really blowing your hair back okay so you're whipping it around in a vertical circle so there's a few extra considerations we have to have here now the first thing that you need to remember is the the centripetal force needed to go in this circle never changes okay it's based on these input variables but what's happening now is that gravity is sort of interfering so if you were able to like measure the tension in your little cord here like say you put a spring scale in there, you would notice fluctuations on the needle of the spring scale. Whereas if you were doing this horizontally, you would not notice fluctuations. It would stay constant. Okay? So these fluctuations are because gravi gravity is involved now. Now that you're in a vertical circle, um, you have to think about what is going to happen with gravity. I think I just said that like five times in a row. So the first thing to remember is if we're just hanging a mass like this, the amount of tension in here is going to be equal and opposite to whatever Fg is, right? So you've got the force of gravity pulling down on this thing, and you have force of tension pulling up, okay? If this now starts to rotate in a circle, when you get to this point, okay, you have Fg pulling down, so that is actually going to be um, not able to be dealt with by this rope, right? So in other words, gravity is at, is at a perpendicular angle to this rope. So I'm going to draw this in all its possible positions as we move it vertically around. We're just going to talk about what happens at each position, and then we're going to talk about the math involved. Okay? So the amount of tension at the bottom, once we start moving this in a circle now, so now this is moving, okay, once this starts traveling in a circular path, the amount of tension has to account for Fg, but it also has to provide the centripetal force to keep this thing moving in a circle. Okay? Now remember, we're aiming in the upward direction here, so we're going to use both positive values on this, okay? We're going to use the magnitudes of these values. The thing to remember is tension is greatest at the bottom, okay? Tension's greatest at the bottom. When you get to the side, the tension does not have to account at all for gravity, and at that point, the tension is just equal to the centripetal force to make it continue in this path. At the top, something else interesting happens. The amount of tension needed in here is going to be equal to the centripetal force minus whatever the magnitude of gravity is. Now, why is that? The reason why is because gravity is providing some of the centripetal force or possibly all of the centripetal force needed to keep this thing going on its circular path. Okay? If you go at just the right speed over the top, essentially this acts just like a projectile. Okay? This tension drops to zero, and that thing just kind of glides over the top of its arc. And then we continue back down to here, Ft equals Fc again. Okay? So mathematically, it's actually quite straightforward. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll deal with the bottom first. And let's put some numbers in here. Let's say you have a mass equal to uh, 500 grams. Let's say you have a velocity equal to, uh, let's say, 10 meters per second probably pretty fast. And let's say we have a, uh, a radius of um, one meter. Okay? And you get asked this. Find Ft at the bottom and the top. Okay? 
of the circle. So let's do the bottom first. So at the bottom, just remember that Ft is going to be the sum of those two forces, right? The tension has to provide centripetal force and enough force to keep that thing from accelerating towards the ground, okay? So it's really just as simple as plugging in your values for these things. Okay? And in this case, I think we said it was 0 0.5 kgs, 10 meters per second. Square that. Radius of 1 plus mg, so 0 0.5 times 9.8 meters per second squared. And our answer will come out in newtons. Let's do some calculating. Okay, so this over here gives us uh, 4.9 newtons. And this gives us 50 newtons. So on the bottom, we have 54.9 newtons. So this is the contribution of gravity. Um, this thing's going really fast, so we need a really high um, centripetal force to keep it going around. Okay, But that's essentially what's going on there. And let's do at the top. So at the top, the centripetal force only needs to provide what gravity is not providing, if you want to think about it that way. So the tension then is going to be centripetal force minus the gravitational force squared over R minus Fg or Mg. And same values as before, right? 0 0.5 kgs. Uh, 10 meters per second, so square that whole thing, radius 1 meter, minus now 4.9, so we should be at like 45.1, is that right? So it's going to be, the tension is going to be lower on the top. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so that's kind of interesting. I don't think there's anything, like, mind-blowing about what's going on there. Um, and, by the way, there's a lot of interesting effects that come from this, right? So you can actually, like, swing a cup of water upside down. And as long as you're going fast enough, okay, it is tending to go on its straight path. Gravity is not great enough to pull it down out from inside the cup. And... The water will feel like, essentially, if you want, a normal force from the bottom of the cup, keeping it on its circular path. So, you know, if you were to get in this cup, you would feel the ground pushing up very hard on you as you whip around in a circle, and you would actually be able to stand upside down, um, which is kind of a neat thing. Now, the interesting thing is, well, what happens if we start to slow down? If we start to slow down, the amount of centripetal force starts to decrease, and at a certain point, gravity will actually be greater than the centripetal force needed and stuff inside the cup and this string itself will go slack and the cup will actually fall off of its you know of its original path and kind of come like falling down to the bottom of its curve that's not a very good curve but okay if, if, gra if it goes slow enough then it falls off the curve and the water falls out and this thing kind of tumbles to the ground what I'm interested in is finding the exact velocity for it to go such that there is no tension force in here. Ft equals zero. What we can essentially say is what is in here is more like a projectile than it is like something in, in, in circular motion, right? So if you were like a little ball and we've done some projectile motion and you got tossed like this, okay, and you're flying through the air, essentially, if you do everything just right, you could actually have a cup swinging at just the right velocity that encapsulates you, but does not actually touch you, okay? So you're basically, if you want, weightless inside here. Can you use this to simulate weightlessness for people? The answer is yes. If you say, got into an airplane, And that's what an airplane looks like. Kind of. It's not a very good airplane, but it's an airplane. And you fly that airplane over the same arc, 
right, over the same arc that a launched object would go, and you happen to be like riding around in here, at that point, there is no normal force from either way on you. And so you are apparently weightless. So you and everyone else inside here can like hang out and like flip upside down because you are essentially thrown objects at that point and you and the plane <clears throat> are following the same parabolic path. So for a split second, or actually I think it's like a minute or something that you can do this for, if you, if you fly over this, this arc, you're weightless at that point. Okay? There is no forces acting on you in terms of, no net forces acting on you to make you feel like you have weight. Okay? Are you with me? So let's figure out this thing. So I want to know what velocity will produce weightlessness. Or will produce, yeah, in this case an FT of zero. Or in the case of like, and they do this for astronauts in training or even to shoot movies sometimes, or even just for fun. I think you get paid to go do this. Um, or to experience weightlessness, I should be careful because it's apparent weightlessness. Um, in vertical circular motion. Okay, so let's say we have this. And let's say we have a guy on a motorbike who wants to like go through the loop of death here. And let's say that um, the radius of this is, I don't know, let's say it's two meters. Okay, what's the slowest he can be going to make it through this loop? So let's see how this would have to work. Um, okay, so essentially, we know that at the top of the loop, we have FC subtract FG. We take just their, you know, their magnitudes, okay? So we take the magnitude of FC, the magnitude of FG, and we would say, okay, whatever speed he can go, where gravity can exactly provide the centripetal force. Oh, I didn't do that very well, did I? Let me just fix what I wrote there, because that makes no sense. <laughs> this is what I want to say, okay? Where force of gravity is exactly providing the centripetal force. Sorry, I shouldn't have put what I put there, okay? So then, this should just be this, right? Mg is totally providing centripetal force. The first thing you notice is that mass becomes an irrelevant part of this problem. Okay, what we want is this V. So it looks like what we end up with is V equals the root of G times R. Now this is a special velocity. It's called the critical velocity. Okay, critical velocity. So in the case of our guy up here, right, the radius of the loop was two meters. So this becomes actually quite an easy problem to solve. DC just equals G times four meters. Or 9.8 meters per second squared times four meters. Oh, sorry, it's two meters. Jeez, I just looked at it too. Eeps. It's Friday. What are you going to do? So let's solve it. Do you think it's going to be a high velocity or a low velocity? You get a velocity equal to 4.4 yeah, meters per second. So as long as this guy is going 4.4 meters per second at the top of the loop, okay, or faster, he will stay on the loop. If he goes slower than that, the R value will shrink to accommodate and he'll fall off the loop. Okay? So the magic velocity is 4.4 meters per second for that loop. Notice there's going to be a critical velocity that is only based on the radius of the of the loop. Okay? 
And um, yeah, it will change with the, with the height of the loop or the radius of the loop. If the radius of the loop gets larger, okay, this value gets larger. Any questions? Okay.